Hey guys, welcome back to EE Tech Reviews. We got a great video this week. We're gonna be going over the 2020 M1 MacBook Pros. We're gonna talk about the build process, what companies like Apple have to go through in order to make this kind of device, this transitional period for them, the specs of the device, some general important comparisons made between them and the MacBook Air, and then finally, should you buy it or not? The main question. The build process. Apple had to make every single item on this chart within the last year and a half, all while again doing the same Intel models, upgrading all of their lineups, their engineering teams are stressed. So we're just gonna quickly go over because some people might not know, what do tech companies have to do in order to output this much and make such a huge change to a whole new core architecture? Fundamentally, tech companies and their output devices for consumers can be broken down into a couple main areas. One is management, Two is going to be the software that runs these devices. Three is the hardware itself. And then four, it's the engineers that test and make sure the devices are good before it's shipped to you, the consumer. Management has a tough job. They need to coordinate information from their salespeople, from corporate clients, from everyone in the industry. What does the future need to be? What's their roadmap for future devices? They take all of this in. Apple said, hey, we want to make our own ship. We want to design our own hardware. We want to have control over our entire architecture. It's a big upbringing, but it gives them the ability to control everything from the physical design of the device all the way to the manufacturing and the release dates. There's no one else they need to rely on. It's under purely Apple's control. But again, they need to figure that out. They need to get it all done. They need to manage who's going to be doing which work and get this all done in parallel to everything else Apple's already doing and within whatever their time span was, probably a couple of years at most. And after this, they have to figure out who's going to be doing which work to get these products up and ready for future upgrades for apps, hardware, RAM, et cetera. There's a lot going on. Software teams, the unsung heroes behind everything that you'll see, they're given a massive list of new features they need to run. And especially with a whole new core architecture, they need to redesign basically the way in which instructions are sent to the arithmetic logic units all the different, the RAM, the memory, they need to figure out exactly how everything's gonna be communicating and how to do it efficiently and quickly so that we, the consumers, really feel that this is a snappy machine. And based on all the reviews for people that have these Macs, I don't have this Mac yet, I'm not one of these big YouTubers, I'm still waiting for mine to show up, but all the reviews and all the benchmarks and everything we've seen have been fantastic and they have continued to do a great job. There are many apps out there that are still being written, they're in beta tests. They have to be written in ARM architecture and off the Intel x86. It's going to take time for them to do it, but just wait. A lot of them are already in beta or scheduled to release in the future. There is a link in the description, and it will show you every single app that has run on Intel processes. Again, that can run on Rosetta or not, and which ones are already in the process of being upgraded for the M1 silicon compatibility. The next major group is the hardware engineers, they need to make schematics all over again, showing every single pin's connection to every single chip, resistor, capacitor, inductor. They're listing out every single piece of hardware on paper. And again, with a new architecture, everything's going to be slightly different. They have less than, usually between every release of a new device, less than a year now to get all of this done and even less time to design it because they got to get the design right quickly and then get it into the hands of the software and the testers to make sure everything's working. Especially with the first device, I know a lot of people say, oh, I don't want to get the first gen of any device. These devices go through such rigorous processes. A lot of it works. It's almost magic, the fact that they can get any of this done within whatever their time frame is, even if it's just a year between iterations. There is so much work that has to get done and so much that has to go right. I personally feel that if it's new technology, if it's pushing the boundaries of what anybody's ever done, I don't feel that it's improper for you to take that leap and to get this device. Don't let that hold you back. Just get it. If there's an issue, you can return it. It's not a huge deal. These Macs are a huge leap forward in performance based on everything I've read and, and seen from all the other YouTubers. And I think it's, it's not worth saying, oh, it's a first-gen device. I'm not going to get it. it. It's definitely worth pushing forward and just going for it. And finally, the testers. These guys are what the software and the hardware engineers hate. They take your device, they use it, they test every aspect, every nook and cranny, they find everything that's broken. And then the hardware and software engineers have to then go and fix it. So in the background, you have management picking out the new features, the new hardware. You have the software and hardware engineers making sure everything works. 
then after it's possibly good, you have to give it to the people that basically destroy the device, make, find every problem with it. And in that same time period, put all the fixes back in before you can ship it to the consumer. Apple has teams of engineers making a lot of money, making sure these work. It's a hard job. Again, trust these people. Very, very smart people are working on these. Again, don't be scared to get it. If something breaks, return it. But again, I am a whole sold in the idea that this is a device worth getting. And just wait. If there's an issue, just wait. And even if you don't like it, keep it for the first year. Trade it back in. And then look to getting the new one when it comes out next year, which I also heard would be a full new redesign. I know it's a lot of random background information, but I hope this helps people just to understand what tech companies are going through in order to make these devices and bring them to market in such a fast period of time. It's truly remarkable and the capability that these devices are continuing to push the boundaries of tech as we know it. All right, guys, let's quickly go through the specs here. I know everyone already knows them, so let's just do this really quickly. The M1 chip, 2020, 13 inch. We see it's native resolution, 2560 by 1600. We already saw this 500 nits of brightness. Their P3 color. The chip itself, eight core GPU, eight core CPU. Something that we might see different in future devices. Four performance scores and four efficiency, and that's great for laptops. Maybe the pros or the, the fancier desktop models will have purely performance cores. Interesting enough, 16 core neural engine. That's what makes those webcams look so much better, even though it's megapixels and its quality are very, very old. Battery power, very, very important. Biggest highlights here, 17 hours for web. I also saw around 20 in other discussions here for TV at playback. 61 watts for the USB power supply, which is good. Any of those adapters that you get third party for monitor support, etc. Make sure they got at least 60 watts of power output. Memory comes with 8 gigs. Again, I said this is going to be great for anybody. I chose the 16 gig model. If it's permanently installed in there, just get the 16. You don't have to regret it later down the road. Same with storage. I went with the one terabyte, but again, 256, 512. You can do whatever you want, have an external drive or anything, and you're all set. Another controversial item, two Thunderbolt ports. I believe it's 3.1, Thunderbolt 3, or USB 4 ports here, supported. And again, they can do everything. If you ever look at a schematic for a Thunderbolt port, it's basically a MUX. You have many different devices that you can plug in all into the same port, and it physically chooses which one you're using. Does the protocol require to send the data? What is a possible issue here is that when repairing, breaking one thing can actually destroy the entire chip there. I've seen repairs where I've seen them look at the actual port itself, one thing will fail in it, and it just destroys its functionality for all possible inputs that you can plug into it. So just be aware if one breaks, you're, you're in pretty big trouble if you're only stuck with one port. It's going to be a costly fix if you don't have Apple Care. But again, you can do everything you want there. Charging, display port, Thunderbolt 3. You can take USB 3.1, Gen 2. And a headphone jack. Keyboard, really know about the keyboard. Don't need to talk about that. Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi 6. You're going to be getting the top speeds. But again, to do that, you're going to need a Wi-Fi 6 router. That's going to be costly. You might need to get a Wi-Fi 6 capable modem that can do the proper rate and all the encapsulation of the packets that you're going to need. That could be an expensive upgrade. Don't worry about it. It can cover everything else. 802.11, all those lower speed rates. Bluetooth 5.0 is great. Love that idea. It's going to be able to connect quickly to any of your headphones. Talked about the camera already. Oh, here you go. Just to fix it. One external display up to 6K at 60 hertz. There is a way to have more than one external display. But basically, it's, it's using one of your cores in your CPU to mimic output of a GPU. So it's basically emulating another GPU output. I believe I saw someone get up to six different output monitors at one time on, an, on these new M1s. Not saying it's worth it. Officially, if it, if it only supports one, the average user should only believe that they can only support one. We'll talk about why it is and how that is later. You can take VGA, HDMI, DVI. Audio. The audio is great. 
We said it's slightly more bass than you'll get on the air, but it's maybe not as good in the highs as the MacBook Air for audio wise. We can see temperatures here. Operating temperatures around 10 to 35. I believe it was around 30 C for idle or low mid 20s for our idle in centigrade. And even when you're gaming, I saw it below 40, around 45, which is fantastic for what, for what you're trying to do with it over long extended periods of time. Anything else here important? Not too much. And then it just goes into all the features here and, and apps that are available. But that's basically it. Nothing else special here to show. All right, and that is the specs. Other than those base specs, let's just go over some noteworthy differences between the MacBook Pro and the MacBook Air with the M1 chips. Number one is that these performances between these chips are going to be very similar. I've seen a ton of YouTubers. They've done all the benchmarks. If you want to see those exact numbers, go look at any of those. But performance is just, again, better performance-wise than the previous Macs. Is it better than 90% of all of the Windows PCs? That remains to be seen. But for general performance and upgrades, I've heard nothing but good things so far. In issues that it is a first-gen product, there could be bugs. Again, that could be limited to just the amount of time they had for testing and the time they had to physically build everything. Only two USB-C ports for Thunderbolt 3. That's definitely a hardware limitation. Upgrading everything, they didn't have enough time to test adding more ports to the same motherboard at this time. It is what it is. Get a dongle, you'll be all right. Brightness, 500 nits on the Pro versus 400 on the Air. What is a huge difference is for 8K video in RAW, the Pro can be two to two and a half times faster in terms of time to process. The base audio-wise on the MacBook Pro is better, whereas the highs and the mids are better on the MacBook Air. The M1 MacBook Air and the 13-inch Pro only officially support one external display, 6K at 60 hertz. There is workarounds to get more, but officially only one external display. And as we've seen in general, the quality is actually still better than some of the expensive products like from Windows like Dell, the XPS. With their neural engine, again, you'll have better picture even though it's a worse camera itself. Some other items, battery life does drop if you're only using Rosetta 2 apps. I did see someone use purely all the Office apps like, like Slack and Office and Outlook, and they were getting under 10 hours, even though they claimed 20, 15, etc. Nine hours plus of just playback of YouTube on full HD with battery savers, so that's very nice actually. Another issue is there's a small amount of app compatibility. Again, you need to know why you want to buy this before you get it. And then only 8 gigs and 16 gigs. 8 gigs of RAM is going to be fine for the average user, for the student. If you're doing hardcore programming or hardcore video editing, I will get the 16 gigs just so you can be able to do it. I did see that with the extra RAM, you do get about 10% gain in overall performance. Another interesting note, I did see someone get over 500 tabs, I believe, in Chrome. Not saying they all worked perfectly well, but the Pro and the Air itself are just able to handle so many more tabs than any of the previous Intel models that were struggling around 100 or 200. Similar temps during use around 30C during idle. We can see the Air and the Pro are just around plus or minus 5 Celsius between each other, even under load. On the Pros, the fan don't even come on until you've hit around 10 minutes worth of 100% CPU usage. That's great. It really shows its efficiency. And that's it for the notable specs that just some people might not know about. Finally, the big decision, should you buy it or not? And as an engineer, I always say, what is the use case? What are you going to be doing most with this device? Are you going to be coding, programming, browsing the internet, going on YouTube, making your videos, editing 4K? 8K, 6K, what are you doing with your videos? And just to list the pros and cons, the reasons I am buying this, again, my perspective as an electrical engineer is I'm going to buy this is because it's the fastest Mac performance so far. It's elite forward. The thermals are great. Temperatures are low during use, even during gaming. The fans don't even spool up on the pros until you've hit very long, prolonged CPU usage. Battery life is fantastic. Just watching something through iTunes, getting 20 hours of just watching video is fantastic. 
This is take your device, charge it like your phone, use it, come back home, charge it for the next day. And even worst case, I saw around nine to 10 hours for intensive items, especially if there's the M1 compatible apps, that's where you're gonna really see those battery savings. Some reasons not to buy, to quickly go through. It's a first gen device. There could be issues, hardware limitations with only two USB-C ports. There's a lot of apps that aren't ready yet. They're going to take a couple months to maybe a year or two for even them to come out. So know exactly what you want to do, what apps you need before you get this device. I would not get this to play games. I would not get this because there's no touchscreen support coming in the near future. And I don't believe there's anything in terms of LTE and 5G coming to these devices at this moment. And that's it for the video, guys. Let me know if this was helpful for you. Maybe it gave you some perspective as to how these devices are made. Please like and subscribe as a new channel. If as soon as I get bigger, I can start getting devices in hand and offer some more compelling YouTube videos. Thanks again, and have a great day, guys.